The experienced politician, it's like one of those insults from yes, Prime Minister, isn't it? <laughs> Very brave decision, Minister. <laughs> um, thank you, Doug, so much for your intro introductory co uh, comments. Thank you to Shelley for uh, her um, lovely start to the day. And uh, thank you uh, so much for acknowledgement of country. Uh, I want to start by thanking Landcare Australia and the National Landcare Network uh, and others for welcoming me here today uh, at your national conference. Um, we're on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and uh, I pay my respects to their elders past and present. We can never forget that land care in Australia has a history of more than 60,000 years and we are so very lucky to share this continent with the world's oldest continuous cultures and most successful environmental custodians. Indigenous Australians have actively managed their country with controlled burning, established fisheries and gradual domestication of native plants. They've developed uh, and maintained a living relationship with the land, not of domination or conquest, but of mutual care and dependence. As contemporary land carers, as supporters of sustainable agriculture, we can all learn from this remarkable example. And that's why I'm so very pleased that our government will double the number of Indigenous rangers by the end of the decade. I've I want to say how delightful it was to watch uh, Peter and Gabrielle in that video at the beginning of the day. So cool, thank you very much. If it's okay, I might share it on my socials because I really think more people should see that. Okay, good. Um, I also want to acknowledge the other speakers joining me this morning. Uh, we just heard, of course, from uh, Doug Human, the Chair of Landcare Australia. We're shortly to hear from Dr Ian Creswell, the co-author uh, of the latest State of the Environment report. And of course, you've got the amazing Costa Adieu I knew I'd do this. Georgiadis. Georgiadis. You'd think with Plibersec as a surname I'd get this stuff right, wouldn't you? Costa is the wizard of worm farming. He is the undisputed king of compost and he is already a legend as the host of Gardening Australia. Um, I've actually met Barack Obama, so it takes a little bit for me to be starstruck, but I actually am starstruck when I talk to Costa. And, um, and the, the proof of this is the first time I met him in real life, um, I saw him in the distance at the airport in Sydney, and I, you know when your brain does that thing where you know you know someone, but you forget you know them from television, not real life? <laughs> I did that, I was like, cost, oh my God, he doesn't know who I am. <laughs> so it's lovely to see you here today, Costa. Um, now, most of you uh, in this room, uh, I guess like me, are very keen amateur botanists. And I've got to say, one of the great drawbacks of the job that I've got at the moment, probably the only drawback, is that I have been spending so much time taking photos of beautiful, you know, lotus flowers growing in the waters of Kakadu, or tiny, tiny little orchids, um, Kakadu, or, you know, new types of banksias that I've never seen before in dry country. My staff have actually been could kind of have, having to factor in extra time and pulling me away from the, the things that I'm photographing down on my knees uh, in the dirt. But I've, I have to say what a beautiful experience uh, it has been, this, this um, you know, previous interest turning into a bit of an obsession. But it's what happens, isn't it? Like, nature gets under your skin and there's something really incredible about the feel of the soil in your hands, as Shelley was reminding us about watching a tiny seed grow into something uh, beautiful and wild. And it really does help you, if you weren't already, to fall in love with the natural world. Costa, you have done so much to light that fire in millions of Australians. Thank you.
Costa is also a worthy successor to another icon of Australian conservation, Peter Cundall. Peter passed away in December last year, aged 94. He, with that incredibly distinctive voice, he lived an amazing life from the streets of Manchester to the Tamar Valley. And I know that all of you in this room would join me in honouring his amazing legacy as well. Friends. Yeah. Um, sorry, my eyes are watering not because I'm crying. I just, there's too much wind and cold outside this morning. Um, friends, this is one of the first invitations that I accepted when I became the Minister for the Environment and Water because um, land care are my people. I really love what you do. I really love what you stand for. And when I retire eventually, uh, I can't imagine a better way of spending my time than getting out every weekend with you uh, and making sure that the, the local bits of bushland in the area that I live, um, that we protect what we've got left with my fellow volunteers. This month, earlier this month, uh, I met with Landcare volunteers in Canberra, the Red Hill Regenerators. This is an area that I, I often walk around behind Parliament House uh, very early in the morning. These people have spent the last 30 years restoring one of the last remnants of red gum and yellow box grassy woodland in Australia. It has been an absolutely painstaking labour of love. When you see the before and after photos, you can see just how much they've done. And they've restored that ground clump by clump, patch by patch, and it won them a very deserved, uh, very well-deserved land care award last year. But after, um, after the event, as I was heading back to Parliament House, it struck me that those Red Hill regenerators could teach my colleagues in Parliament House some very useful lessons. Because if you hear, if you listen to the debate that we have about the environment uh, in Parliament year after year, you would hear a, a great deal of nonsense, frankly. You hear that climate change is something that only people in cities care about, that people in the country don't care about climate change. Or you would hear that the environment is somehow a luxury issue that we can only afford to deal with after we've dealt with these so-called bread and butter issues. Or you would hear that Caring for the environment is a hobby for sandal wearers and, and latte sippers, um, which of course probably really confuses those people in the country who do like a nice cup of coffee and the rural baristas who've been making very good coffee for many, many years now. But I, I go back to this. Land carers don't get caught up in these nonsense, divisive silly debates about the importance of the environment. I think probably every land care group in Australia has a pretty broad range of um, political views. I think there's probably people who vote in all different ways in land care groups. That's not the point. The point is getting together to clear up your local waterway, restore a patch of bushland, restore native vegetation on a back paddock, so that a threatened species has a better chance of survival, so that we restore some of the habitat, too much habitat that we've lost. It's helping farmers improve their soil so that their farms can be more efficient and more productive. It's teaching a new generation of kids, including kids from the city, about land and agriculture and where food comes from. And that's what land care has always been about, and it's why it's been such an enduring success. Because I think people are hungry for these sorts of opportunities, the opportunity to do something that is practical, that is optimistic, where you see the results of your labour, where you solve problems and look after country and bring people together. When Bob Hawke first announced the National Decade of Land Care back in 1989, he had with him Rick Farley and Philip Toyne. 
the President of the National Farmers Federation and the President of the Australian Conservation Foundation. And the three of them were there together in Wentworth, the town of Wentworth, which is at the point where two great rivers, the Murray and the Darling, finally converged together. Bob acknowledged on that day that land care organisations, uh, sorry, that the um, National Farmers Federation and the Australian Conservation Foundation were probably not, he said these organisations were, one would probably not imagine forming an alliance. But I don't think, I don't think it's that surprising, to be honest. Because as Rick and Philip both argued at the time, farmers and conservationists had and have a great deal in common. Australian farmers were concerned about the growing cost of erosion, soil degradation and a loss of fertility in the land. And conservationists were worried about what this immense ecological stress would mean for the vast expanse of Australia that is covered by agriculture. And that's how it all began, with a farmer and a greenie and a trade unionist. Three decades later, those three have grown into well over 100,000 people with 6,000 chapters around the country. And from land care, we've branched into junior land care, intrepid land care, coast care, river care, dune care, bush care. Land care didn't just bring farmers and conservationists together, it brought out the inner conservationist in farmers, and it helped environmentalists better understand the realities of rural life. It tapped into a form of country environmentalism that was always there, but needed to be encouraged to thrive, just like a seedling from the soil. It should have been obvious, because no one lives closer to nature than people on the land, and no one is more reliant on a healthy environment and a stable climate for their economic viability. So we need to um, remember that out of this daily connection with the land comes uh, a, a love that you can't uh, imagine from a distance and a connection that you can't imagine from a distance. Landcare has helped break down the walls between the city and the country. And I, I think it's really important to say it's also helped break down barriers between men and women because Landcare has always been an organisation that has made space for female leadership. In fact, before Bob Hawke, the, ter the time that the term land care was first used in Australia, it was an agreement between Joan Kerner and Heather Mitchell, the first Premier of Victoria and the first female president of the Victorian Farmers Federation. Again, at a glance, a kind of odd couple, a country liberal from Horsham and a Labor activist from Essendon. But Landcare created a lifelong bond between these two trailblazing women. And Joan Kerner gave the most beautiful eulogy at Heather's funeral. That was the story of Landcare in miniature, bringing unexpected groups of people together, transcending differences, and finding real solutions for our environment. That's why the land care model is as relevant and as important today as it's ever been. When I became the Minister for the Environment, one of the first things I did was to publicly release the State of the Environment report, which the previous government had kept secret. I know Dr Ian Creswell will be speaking after me and as one of the lead authors of the report, he'll be able to expand on the findings of that report in more detail. The team of researchers did an incredible job, but they produced a very disturbing piece of work. 
We found from the report that Australia is now the mammal extinction capital of the world, having lost more species than any other continent. In the past five years, the number of threatened ecological communities has grown by 20%. The number of threatened species has grown by almost 10%. And for the first time in Australian history, we have more foreign plant species than native ones in this country. So it's clear that while groups like Landcare are doing absolutely brilliant work on the ground, that you continue to be let down, that work continues to be let down by inadequate environmental laws. Professor Graham Samuel reviewed the Commonwealth um, Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act two years ago, and he concluded that our environmental decisions are slow, they lack coherence, and worst of all, they don't actually protect our environment. That's why our government is committed to rewriting our national environmental laws to build... because we need to build trust, we need to build integrity and efficiency into the system. It's also why we have committed to setting up a new environmental protection agency to make sure that these laws are being enforced in practice. We know that quite often project proponents give undertakings. If we're not checking that those undertakings are being met, we've got a problem. We need to make sure our laws are strong, but the enforcement of those laws is also strong. <laughs> and so today I'm announcing a third element of this agenda, which is much better regional planning. Currently, most Commonwealth environmental approval decisions are done on a project-by-project -project basis. But these individual decisions don't take into account the cumulative impact of human activity, which actually places the environment under enormous stress. So currently, an approval decision considers whether a single block of new housing you know, what will it do to koala habitat? But it doesn't consider together what a dozen different new developments will do in the same stretch of bushland. One of the most disturbing elements of the State of the Environment Report is the record of how much habitat we've lost that wasn't even looked at by our current environmental laws. If we only assess each of these applications on its own, rather than looking at their impact on a living region with all its organic connections and relationships, you might think that everything's gonna be fine, but that ignores the combined pressure that overlapping changes might be placing on the same ecosystem or waterway. And it means that we don't know when a system or a species is reaching a breaking point or falling below critical mass. It's not usually the first proposal that's the problem, it's the 10th proposal or the 15th. And that's how we end up with a state of the environment report that tells us that the state of our environment is bad and getting worse. Or take another example, it doesn't always make sense to manage every threatened species individually as we currently do. It's because within a region, many species are facing the same set of threats. It could be cats on Kangaroo Island or gamber grass in Kakadu or feral horses in the Alpine region. In, in these cases, it's not clear why we manage these threats as though they apply only to an individual species and then another individual species or a single property in that area. It is much, much more effective for us to be thinking 
and acting regionally. So regional plans can tell us which habitats are growing in abundance. They can tell us which habitats have been so degraded that even minor additional projects could have catastrophic consequences. They can tell us which areas are vital for connectivity in a landscape where animals can travel for food and water or to escape natural disasters like bushfires. Regional plans can tell us which parts of the landscape need to be protected and they can tell us where projects can proceed with minimal impact. So these plans are like good data and effective compliance. They're not directly a part of our environmental laws, but without them, our laws can't deliver the standards of protection we expect. So I know that a lot of you are thinking regional planning's not new, hardly an announcement. Of course, we've been doing regional planning in different parts of Australia in different ways at different times. And if you've been around for a while, you may well have taken part in some of these regional planning exercises. We already have regional national resource management schemes and some states have their own regional development plans. And so that's true, a lot of regional planning work's already been done. We're not going to go in and pull apart what is already working and start from scratch. So we'll build on that start. But what we are talking about today that is clearly and unequivocally new is that these regional plans will be used by the Commonwealth to underpin and improve our Commonwealth system of environmental protection to help us better understand the cumulative impact uh, of individual projects and past decisions and more effectively address threats to our vulnerable and threatened species. So I'll be talking to my fellow environment ministers uh, shortly about how we can make these regional plans strong and useful and help us avoid duplication. Because if the Commonwealth and the states can agree on the way forward with regional planning, these regional plans become much more useful and much more enforceable. They provide much greater certainty. And so I'll be consulting with stakeholders, with people involved in managing our land and waterways, who've got an interest in land use and planning. And that means, first of all, First Nations Australians, it means national resource management organisations, it means farmers, it means industry, it means community and volunteer groups, and of course, it means the land care movement represented here today. Everybody needs an opportunity to be involved in consultation about how regional planning will work and the planning process itself. We need people who are experts in planning, we need local knowledge on the ground knowledge as well. Because we want plans to be integrated across land uses, programs and tenures. We don't want kind of crazy artificial barriers getting in the way of us managing ecosystems as ecosystems. Like it doesn't matter to the environment if there's a state border or a local government border breaking up an ecosystem and the fact that we you know, end up having all these different systems that are trying to take account of these artificial borders means this, the, the system is much less effective than it needs to be. So of course, our environmental management needs to adjust to the landscape as it exists, not force our models onto the natural world. And that means plans need to be guided by evidence, good science, and so importantly, take account of our changing environment, our changing climate. Improving resilience to climate change needs to be at the heart of everything we do. So we'll start working on these regional plans immediately. My department will consult on the practicalities like how we decide boundaries, how we work across these divisions, how plans will be formalised. 
We want regional planning to be well underway by the time we pass our improved environmental laws next year. The rollout will happen over time and no doubt these, these early plans will evolve to be more sophisticated over time because, friends, these are big changes. New Commonwealth environmental laws, a new environmental protection agency, regional planning and tomorrow the Prime Minister will announce another important part of our environmental agenda. I, I'd love to tell you today but I'd have to keep you all locked up till four o'clock tomorrow afternoon if I did that. Um, but watch this space. If we don't act now, if we don't change our behaviour, if we don't begin to treat our home more gently, we'll be resigning ourselves to another generation of decline and loss. We need to reform our systems of environmental protection. But legal changes only succeed if they're matched in the community, if they're supported by millions of Australians in every state, in every suburb, in every town, doing their part for the environment. So being here today, seeing the inspiring work that Landcare is doing around the country, fills me with hope. And it reminds me of the way my dad was when we were growing up. My first visit to his home in Slovenia where he was born, he showed me the walnut tree that he'd planted 40 years earlier. Um, but, you know, at home in Oyster Bay when we were growing up, every Saturday I'd see my dad fill up these two enormous buckets, you know, like, I don't know what they are, 20, kind of 20 gallon buckets of water. He'd fill them up at the tap in our front yard and he'd walk across to the park every Saturday or Sunday in summer and water the trees that the council had planted there. They wouldn't have ever survived without the watering that he did. And he didn't, he didn't do it, um, you know, was part of an organised group. He didn't do it for any credit or recognition. He did it because he wanted to see a better environment in his local community. He wanted those trees to grow and thrive, and they're there today, and they're home for birds and bats and bees and all sorts of important things in his little, in his little patch of suburbia. He never said anything about why he was doing it, but that example has always stayed with me, that each of us has a responsibility to the environment, that each of us should do what we can where we are with what we have, help in our own way, big or small. That was, his, that was the message he gave me by his behaviour. It's also the message of land care. So thank you, each one of you, and please take this message back to your land care groups. Thank you for what you do. This organisation, these, your organisations on the ground are a national treasure and every one of you should be so very proud of your contribution. Thank you.